The Labor of the Inhuman, Part 1, Human. By Rizane Garastani. Inhumanism is the extended practical elaboration of humanism, it is born out of a diligent commitment to the project of enlightened humanism. As a universal wave that erases the self-portrait of man drawn in sand, inhumanism is a vector of revision. It relentlessly revises what it means to be human by removing its supposed evident characteristics and preserving certain invariances. At the same time, inhumanism registers itself as a demand for construction, to define what it means to be human by treating human as a constructible hypothesis, a space of navigation and intervention. Inhumanism stands in concrete opposition to any paradigm that seeks to degrade humanity either in the face of its finitude or against the backdrop of the great outdoors. Its labor partly consists in decanting the significance of human from any predetermined meaning or particular import set by theology, thereby extricating human significance from human veneration fabricated as a result of assigning significance to varieties of theological jurisdiction, God ineffable genocity, foundationalist axiom, and so forth. Once the conflated and the honorific meaning of man is replaced by a minimalist yet functionally consequential, real content, the humilific credo of anti-humanism that subsists on a theologically anchored conflation between significance and veneration also loses its deflationary momentum. Incapable of salvaging its pertinence without resorting to a concept of crisis occasioned by theology and unsuccessful in extracting human significance by disentangling the pathological conflation between real import and glorification, anti-humanism is revealed to be in the same theological boat that it is so determined to set on fire. Failing to single out significance according to the physics that posits it rather than the metaphysics that inflates it, anti-humanism's only solution for overcoming the purported crisis of meaning comes by adopting the cultural heterogeneity of false alternatives, the ever-increasing options of post-communitarian retreats as so-called alternatives to totality, and so forth. Rooted in an originary conflation that was never resolved, such alternatives perpetually swing between their inflationary and deflationary, enchanting and disenchanting bipolar extremes creating a fog of liberty that suffocates any universalist ambition and hinders the methodological collaboration required to define and achieve a common task for breaking out of the current planetary morass. In short, the net surfeit of false alternatives supplied under the rubric of liberal freedom causes a terminal deficit of real alternatives, establishing for thought and action the axiom that there is indeed no alternative. The contention of this essay is that universality and collectivism cannot be thought, let alone attained, through consensus or dissensus between cultural tropes, but only by intercepting and rooting out what gives rise to the economy of false choices and by activating and fully elaborating what real human significance consists of. For it is, as will be argued, the truth of human significance, not in the sense of an original meaning or a birthright but in the sense of a labor that consists of the extended elaboration of what it means to be human through a series of upgradable special performances, that is rigorously inhuman. The force of inhumanism operates as a retroactive deterrence against anti-humanism by understanding humanity historically, in the broadest physico-biological and socio-economical sense of history, as an indispensable runway toward itself. But what is humanism? What specific commitment does being human represent and how does the full practical elaboration of this commitment amount to inhumanism? In other words, what is it inhuman that shapes the inhuman once it is developed in terms of its entitlements and consequences? In order to answer these questions, first we need to define what it means to be human and exactly what commitment being human endorses. Then we need to analyze the structure of this commitment in order to grasp how undertaking such a commitment, in the sense of practicing it, entails in humanism. 1. Commitment as extended and multimodal elaboration. A commitment only makes sense by virtue of its pragmatic content, meaning through use, and its demand to adopt an intervening attitude. This attitude aims to elaborate the content of a commitment and then update that commitment according to the ramifications or collateral commitments that are made explicit in the course of elaboration. In short, a commitment, be it assertional, inferential, practical, 
or cognitive, can neither be examined nor properly undertaken without the process of updating the commitment and unpacking its consequences through a full range of multimodal practices. In this sense, humanism is a commitment to humanity, but only by virtue of what a commitment is and what human is combined together. The analysis of the structure and laws of commitment making and the meaning of being human in a pragmatic sense, that is, not by resorting to an inherent conception of meaning hidden in nature or a predetermined idea of man, is a necessary initial step before entering the domain of making prescriptions, whether social, political, or ethical. What needs to be explicated first is what it takes to make a prescription, or what one needs to do in order to count as prescribing an obligation or a duty, to link duties and revise them. But it must also be recognized that a prescription should correspond to a set of descriptions which at all times must be synchronized with the system of modern knowledge as what yields and modifies descriptions. To put it succinctly, description without prescription is the germ of resignation, and prescription without description is whim. Correspondingly, this is an attempt to understand the organization of prescription, or what making a prescription for and by human entails. Without such knowledge, prescriptive norms cannot be adequately distinguished from descriptive norms, that is, we cannot have prescriptions, nor can proper prescriptions be constructed without degenerating into the vacuity of prescriptions devoid of descriptions. The description of the content of human is impossible without elaborating it in the context of use and practices, while elaboration itself is impossible without following minimally prescriptive laws of commitment making inference, and judgment. Describing human without turning to an account of foundational descriptions or an a priori access to descriptive resources is already a minimally but functionally hegemonic prescriptive project that adheres to orts of specification and elaboration of the meaning of being human through features and requirements of its use. Fraught with orts, Wilfred Sellers, humanism cannot be regarded as a claim about human that can only be professed once and subsequently turned into a foundation or axiom and considered concluded. Inhumanism is a nomenclature for the infeasibility of this one-time profession. It is a figure for the impossibility of ever putting the matter to rest once and for all. To be human is a mark of a distinction between, on the one hand, the relation between mindedness and behavior through the intervention of discursive intentionality, and on the other hand, the relation between sentient intelligence and behavior in the absence of such mediation. It is a distinction between sentience as a strongly biological and natural category and sapience as a rational, not to be confused with logical, subject. The latter is a normative designation which is specified by entitlements and the responsibilities they bring about. It is important to note that the distinction between sapience and sentience is marked by a functional demarcation rather than a structural one. Therefore, it is still fully historical and open to naturalization, while at the same time being distinguished by its specific functional organization its upgradable set of abilities and responsibilities, its cognitive and practical demands. The relation between sentience and sapience can be understood as a continuum that is not differentiable everywhere. While such a complex continuity might allow the naturalization of normative obligations at the level of sapience, their explanation in terms of naturalistic causes, it does not permit the extension of certain conceptual and descriptive resources specific to sapience, such as the particular level of mindedness, responsibilities, and, accordingly, normative entitlements, to sentience and beyond. The rational demarcation lies in the difference between being capable of acknowledging a law and being solely bound by a law, between understanding and mere reliable responsiveness to stimuli. It lies in the difference between stabilized communication through concepts as made possible by the communal space of language and symbolic forms, and chaotically unstable or transient types of response or communication, such as complex reactions triggered purely by biological states and organic requirements or group calls and alerts among social animals. Without such stabilization of communication through concepts and modes of inference involved in conception, the cultural evolution as well as the conceptual accumulation and refinement required for the evolution of knowledge as a shared enterprise would be impossible.
Ultimately, the necessary content as well as the real possibility of human rests on the ability of sapience, as functionally distinct from sentience, to practice inference and approach non-canonical truth by entering the dyntic game of giving and asking for reasons. It is a game solely in the sense of involving error-tolerant, rule-based practices conducted in the absence of a referee, in which taking as true through thinking, the mark of a believer, and making true through acting, the mark of an agent, are constantly contrasted, gauged, and calibrated. It is a dynamic feedback loop in which the expansion of one frontier provides the other with new alternatives and opportunities for diversifying its space and pushing back its boundaries according to its own specifications. 2. A discursive and constructible we. What combines both the ability to infer and the ability to approach truth, that is, truth in the sense of making sense of taking as true and making true, separately and in conjunction with one another, is the capacity to engage discursive practices in the way that pragmatism describes it, as the ability to, 1, deploy a vocabulary, 2, use a vocabulary to specify a set of abilities or practices, 3, elaborate one set of abilities or practices in terms of another set of abilities or practices, and, 4, use one vocabulary to characterize another. Discursive practices constitute the game of giving and asking for reasons and outlining the space of reason as a landscape of navigation rather than as a priori access to explicit norms. The capacity to engage discursive practices is what functionally distinguishes sapience from sentience. Without such a capacity, human is only a biological fact that does not by itself yield any propositional contentfulness of the kind that demands a special form of conduct and value attribution and appraisal. Without this key aspect, speaking about the history of human risks reducing the social construction to a biological supervenience while depriving history of its possibilities for intervention and reorientation. In other words, Deprived of the capacity to enter the space of reason through discursive practices, being human is barred from meaning anything in the sense of practice in relation to content. Action is reduced to meaning just do something, collectivity can never be methodological or expressed in terms of a synthesis of different abilities to envision and achieve a common task, and making commitment through linking action and understanding is untenable. We might just as well replace human with whatever we wish so as to construct a stuff-oriented philosophy and a non-human ethics where to be a thing simply warrants being good to each other, or to vegetables for that matter. Once discursive practices that map out the space of reason are underplayed or dispensed with, everything lapses either toward the individual or toward a noumenal alterity where a contentless plurality without any demand or duty can be effortlessly maintained. Discursive practices as rooted in language use and tool use generate a deprivatized but nonetheless stabilizing and contextualizing space through which true collectivizing processes are shaped. It is the space of reason that harbors the functional kernel of a genuine collectivity, a collaborative project of practical freedom referred to as we whose boundaries are not only negotiable but also constructible and synthetic. One should be reminded that we as a mode of being, and a mode of being is not an ontological given or a domain exclusive to a set of fundamental categories or fixed descriptions. Instead, it is a conduct, a special performance that takes shape as it is made visible to others. Precluding this explicit and discursively mobilizable we, the content of being human never translates to commitment to human or to humanity. By undergirding we, Discursive practices organize commitments as ramifying trajectories between communal saying and doing, and they enact a space where the self-construction or extensive practical elaboration of humanity is a collaborative project. Making a commitment to something means vacillating between doing something in order to count as saying it, and saying something specific in order to express and characterize that doing. It is the movement back and forth, the feedback loop between the two fields of claims and actions that defines sapience as distinguished from sentience. To make a commitment means what else, what other commitments it brings forth and how such consequent commitments demand new modes of action and understanding, new abilities and special performances that cannot be simply substituted with old abilities because they are dictated by revised or more complex sets of demands and entitlements.
without ramifying the what else of a commitment by practically elaborating it, without navigating what Robert Brandom calls the rational system of commitments, a commitment has neither sufficient content nor a real possibility of assessment or development. It is as good as an empty utterance, that is, an utterance devoid of content or significance even though it earnestly aspires to be committed. 3. Intervention as Construction and Revision Now we can turn the argument regarding the exigencies of making a commitment into an argument about the exigencies of being a human, insofar as humanism is a system of practical and cognitive commitments to the concept of humanity. The argument goes as follows, in order to commit to humanity, the content of humanity must be scrutinized. To scrutinize this content, its implicit commitments must be elaborated. But this task is impossible unless we take humanity as a commitment to its ultimate conclusion, by asking what else being a human entails, by unfolding the other commitments and ramifications it brings about. But since the content of humanity is distinguished by its capacity to engage rational norms rather than natural laws, ought instead of is, the concept of entailment for humanity as a commitment is non-monotonic. That is to say, entailment no longer expresses a cause and its differential effect, as in physical natural laws or a deductive logical consequence. Instead, it expresses enablement and abductive non-monotonicity in the sense of a manipulable, experimental, and synthetic form of inference whose consequences are not simply dictated by premises or initial conditions. Since non-monotonicity is an aspect of practice and complex heuristics, defining the human through practical elaboration means that the product of elaboration does not correspond with what the human anticipates or with the image it has of itself. In other words, the result of an abductive inference that synthetically manipulates parameters, the result of practice as a non-monotonic procedure, will be radically revisionary to our assumptions and expectations about what we is and what it entails. The non-monotonic and abductive characteristics of robust social practices that form and undergird the space of reason turn reasoning and the intervening attitude that it promotes into ongoing processes. Indeed, reason as rooted in social practices is not necessarily directed toward a conclusion, nor is it aimed at establishing agreements through the kind of substantive and quasi-instrumentalist account of reason proposed by Jurgen Habermas. Reason's main objective is to maintain and enhance itself. And it is the self-actualization of reason that coincides with the truth of the inhuman. The unpacking of the content of commitment to humanity, the examination of what else humanity entitles us to, is impossible without developing a certain intervening attitude that simultaneously involves the assessment, or consumption, and the construction, or production, of norms. Only this intervening attitude toward the concept of humanity is able to extract and unpack the implicit commitments of being a human. And it is this intervening attitude that counts as an enabling vector, making possible certain abilities otherwise hidden or deemed impossible. It is through the consumption and production of norms that the content of a commitment to humanity can be grasped, in the sense of both assessment and making explicit the implicit commitments that it entitles us to. Accordingly, to understand the commitment to humanity and to make such a commitment, it is imperative to assume a constructive and revisionary stance with regard to human. This is the intervening attitude mentioned earlier. Revising and constructing human is the very definition of committing to humanity. Lacking this perpetual revision and construction, the commitment part of committing to humanity does not make sense at all. But also insofar as humanity cannot be defined without locating it in the space of reasons, the sapiens argument, committing to humanity is tantamount to complying with the revisionary vector of reason and constructing humanity according to an autonomous account of reason. Humanity is not simply a given fact that is behind us. It is a commitment in which the reassessing and constructive strains inherent to making a commitment and complying with reason intertwine. In a nutshell, to be human is a struggle. The aim of this struggle is to respond to the demands of constructing and revising human through the space of reasons. This struggle is characterized as developing a certain conduct or error-tolerant deportment according to the functional autonomy of reason, an intervening attitude whose aim is to unlock new abilities of saying and doing. In other words, 
it is to open up new frontiers of action and understanding through various modes of construction and practices, social, technological, and so forth. 4. Kitsch Marxism. If committing to being human is a struggle to construct and revise, today's humanism is for the most part a hollow enterprise that neither does what it says nor says what it does. Socio-political philosophies seeking to safeguard the dignity of humanity against the onslaught of politico-economic leviathans end up joining them from the other side. By virtue of its refusal to recognize the autonomy of reason and to systematically invest in an intervening, that is, revisionary and constructive, attitude toward human and toward norms implicit in social practices. Contemporary Marxism largely fails to produce norms of action and understanding. In effect, it subtracts itself from the future of humanity. Only through the construction of what it means to be human can norms of committing to humanity be produced. Only by revising existing norms through norms that have been produced is it possible to assess norms and above all evaluate what it means to be human. Again, these norms should be distinguished from social conventions. Nor should these norms be confused with natural laws, they are not laws, they are conceptions of laws, hence they are error tolerant and open to revision. The production or construction of norms prompts the consumption or assessment of norms, which in turn leads to a demand for the production of newer abilities and more complex normative attitudes. One cannot assess norms without producing them. The same can be said about assessing the situation of humanity. The status of the commitment to be human, humanity cannot be assessed in any context or situation unless an intervening, constructive attitude toward it is developed. But to develop this constructive attitude toward human means to emphatically revise what it means to be human. A dedication to a project of militant negativity and an abandonment of the ambition to develop an intervening and constructive attitude toward human through various social and technological practices is now the hallmark of Kitsch Marxism. While Kitsch Marxism should not be inflated to the whole of Marxism, especially since class struggle as a central tenet of Marxism is an indispensable historical project, at this point the claim of being a Marxist is too generic. It is like saying, I am an animal. It does not serve any theoretical or practical purpose. The assessment of any Marxist agenda should be done by way of determining whether it has the power to elaborate its commitments, whether it understands the underlying mechanisms involved in making a commitment, and above all, whether it possesses a program for globally updating its commitments. Once practical negativity is valorized and the intervening attitude or the constructive deportment is dismissed, the assessment of humanity and its situations becomes fundamentally problematic on the following levels. Without the constructive vector, the project of evaluation, the critique, is transformed into a merely consumptive attitude toward norms. Consumption of norms without producing any is the concrete reality of today's Marxist critical theory. For every claim, there exists a pre-packaged set of critical reflexes. One makes a claim in favor of the force of better reason. The kitsch Marxist says, who decides? One says, construction through structural and functional hierarchies. The kitsch Marxist responds, control. One says, normative control. The kitsch Marxist reminds us of authoritarianism. We say us. The kitsch Marxist recites, who is us? The impulsive responsiveness of Kitsch Marxism cannot even be identified as a cynical attitude because it lacks the rigor of cynicism. It is a mechanized knee jerk reaction, is that is the genuine expression of norm consumerism without the concrete commitment to producing any norms. Norm consumerism is another name for cognitive servitude and neetic sloth. The response of Kitsch Marxism to humanity is also problematic on the level of revision. Ceasing to produce norms by refusing to undertake a constructive attitude toward human in the sense of a deportment governed by the functional autonomy of reason means ceasing to revise what it means to be human. Why? Because norms are assessed and revised by new air norms that are produced through various modes of construction, complex social practices, and the unlocking of new abilities for going back and forth between saying and doing. Since being human is distinguished by its capacity to enter the game of giving and asking for reasons, 
the construction of human ought to be in the direction of further singling out the space of reason through which human differentiates itself from non-human, sapience from sentience. By transforming the ethos of construction according to the demands of reason into the pathos of negativity, Kitsch Marxism not only puts an end to the project of revision, it also banks on a concept of humanity outside of the space of reason, even though reason's revisionary force is the only authorized force for renegotiating and defining humanity. Once revision is brought to an end, understanding humanity and acting upon its situations has no significance, since what is deemed to be human no longer enjoys any pertinence. Similarly, once the image of humanity is sought outside of reason, it is only a matter of time before the deontological distinction between sapience and sentience collapses and telltale signs of irrationalism, frivolity, narcissism, superstition, speculative enthusiasm, social atavism, and ultimately, tyranny, heave forth. Therefore, the first question one needs to ask a humanist or a Marxist is, are your commitments up to date? If yes, then they must be subjected to a deontic trial either a version of Robert Brandom's deontic scorekeeping or Jean Eve Girard's deontic ordeal, where commitments can be reviewed on the basis of their connectivity, evasion of vicious circles and internal contradictions, and recusal instead of refutation. If commitment to humanity is identified by active revision and construction, ceasing to revise and refusing to construct characterize a form of irrationalism that is determined to cancel out what it means to be human. It is in this sense that Kitsch Marxism is not just a theoretical incompetency. It is also, from both a historical and cognitive standpoint, an impulse to regress from sapience back to sentience. To this extent, it is not an exaggeration to say that within every Kitsch Marxist agenda lies dormant the germ of hostility to humanity and the humanist project. Practical negativity refuses to be a resignation but it also refuses to contribute to the system and develop a systematic attitude toward the affirmative stance implicit in the construction of the system. Humanism is distinguished by the implicitly affirmative attitude of construction. Insofar as the Kitsch Marxism resignation implies an abandonment of the project of humanism and a collapse into regressive passivity, we can say that Kitsch Marxism's refusal to both resign and to construct is tantamount to a position that is neither passive nor humanist. Indeed, this neither, nor approach signifies nothing but a project of active anti-humanism that Kitsch Marxism is in reality committed to, despite its pretensions to a commitment to human. It is in the wake of this anti-humanism or hostility toward ramifications of committing to human that the identification of Kitsch Marxist agendas with humanism appears at best as a farce, and at worst as a critical Ponzi scheme for devoted humanists. In its mission to link the commitment to humanism to complex abilities and commitments, inhumanism appears as a force that stands against both the apathy of resignation and the active anti-humanism implicit in practical negativity as the fashionable stance of kitsch Marxism today. Inhumanism, as will be argued in the next installment of this essay, is both the extended elaboration of the ramifications of making a commitment to humanity, and the practical elaboration of the content of human as provided by reason and the sapient's capacity to functionally distinguish itself and engage in discursive social practices. The Labor of the Inhuman, Part 2, The Inhuman Enlightened humanism as a project of commitment to humanity, in the entangled sense of what it means to be human and what it means to make a commitment, is a rational project. It is rational not only because it locates the meaning of human in the space of reasons as a specific horizon of practices, but also and more importantly, because the concept of commitment it adheres to cannot be thought or practiced as a voluntaristic impulse free of ramifications and growing obligations. Instead, this is commitment as a rational system for navigating collateral commitments, their ramifications as well as their specific entitlements that result from making an initial commitment. Interaction with the rational system of commitments follows a navigational paradigm in which the ramifications of an initial commitment must be compulsively elaborated and navigated in order for this commitment to make sense as an undertaking. It is the examination of the rational fallout of making a commitment, the unpacking of its far-reaching consequences, 
and the treating of these ramifications as paths to be explored that shapes commitment to humanity as a navigational project. Here, navigation is not only a survey of a landscape whose full scope is not given, it is also an exercise in the non-monotonic procedures of steering, plotting out routes, suspending navigational preconceptions rejecting or resolving incompatible commitments, exploring the space of possibilities, and understanding each path as a hypothesis leading to new paths or all act thereof, transits as well as obstructions. From a rational perspective, a commitment is seen as a cascade of ramifying paths that is in the process of expanding its frontiers, developing into an evolving landscape, unmooring its fixed perspectives deracinating any form of rootedness associated with a fixed commitment or immutable responsibilities, revising links and addresses between its old and new commitments, and finally, erasing any image of itself as what it was supposed to be. To place the meaning of human in the rational system of commitments is to submit the presumed stability of this meaning to the perturbing and transformative power of a landscape undergoing comprehensive changes under the revisionary thrust of its ramifying destinations. By situating itself in the rational system of commitments, humanism posits itself as an initial condition for what already retroactively bears a minimal resemblance, if any at all, to what originally set it in motion. Sufficiently elaborated, humanism, it shall be argued, is the initial condition of inhumanism as a force that travels back from the future to alter, if not to completely discontinue, the command of its origin. 1. The picture of us drawn in sand. The practical elaboration of making a commitment to humanity is inhumanism. If making a commitment means fully elaborating the content of such a commitment, the consequent what else? of what it means to be human, and if to be human means being able to enter the space of reason, then a commitment to humanity must fully elaborate how the abilities of reason functionally convert sentience to sapience. But insofar as reason enjoys a functional autonomy, which enables it to prevent the collapse of sapience back into sentience, the full elaboration of the abilities of reason entails unpacking the consequences of the autonomy of reason for human. Humanism is by definition a project to amplify the space of reason through elaborating what the autonomy of reason entails and what demands it makes upon us. But the autonomy of reason implies its autonomy to assess and construct itself, and by extension, to renegotiate and construct that which distinguishes itself by entering the space of reason. In other words, the self-cultivation of reason, which is the emblem of its functional autonomy materializes as staggering consequences for humanity. What reason does to itself inevitably takes effect as what it does to human. Since the functional autonomy of reason implies the self-determination of reason with regard to its own conduct, insofar as reason cannot be assessed or revised by anything other than itself, to avoid equivocation or superstition commitment to such autonomy effectively exposes what it means to be human to the sweeping revisionary effect of reason. In a sense, the autonomy of reason is the autonomy of its power to revise, and commitment to the autonomy of reason, via the project of humanism, is a commitment to the autonomy of reason's revisionary program over which human has no hold. Inhumanism is exactly the activation of the revisionary program of reason against the self-portrait of humanity. Once the structure and the function of commitment are genuinely understood, we see that a commitment works its way back from the future, from the collateral commitments of one's current commitment, like a corrosive revisionary acid that rushes backward in time. By eroding the anchoring link between present commitments and their past, and by seeing present commitments from the perspective of their ramifications, revision forces the updating of present commitments in a cascading fashion that spreads globally over the entire system. The rational structure of a commitment, or more specifically, of commitment to humanity, constructs the opportunities of the present by cultivating the positive trends of the past through the revisionary forces of the future. Once you commit to human, you effectively start erasing its canonical portrait backward from the future. It is, as a Foucault suggests, the unyielding wager on the fact that the self-portrait of man will be erased, like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea. Every portrait drawn is washed away by the revisionary power of reason, 
permitting more subtle portraits with so few canonical traits that one should ask whether it is worthwhile or useful to call what is left behind human at all. Inhumanism is the labor of rational agency on human. But there is one caveat here, the rational agency is not personal, individual, or necessarily biological. The kernel of inhumanism is a commitment to humanity via the concurrent construction and revision of human as oriented and regulated by the autonomy of reason, that is, its self-determination and responsibility for its own needs. In the space of reason, construction entails revision, and revision demands construction. The revision of the alleged portrait of human implies that the construction of human in whatever context can be exercised without recourse to a constitutive foundation, a fundamental identity, an immaculate nature, a given meaning, or a prior state. In short, revision is a license for further construction. 2. When we lost contact with what is becoming of us. Whereas, as Michael Ferrer points out, Anti-humanism is devoted to the unfeasible task of deflating the conflation of human significance with human veneration, inhumanism is a project that begins by dissociating human significance from human glory. Resolving the content of conflation and extracting significance from its honorific residues, inhumanism then takes humanism to its ultimate conclusions. It does so by constructing a revisable picture of us that functionally breaks free from our expectations and historical biases regarding what this image should be, look like, or mean. For this reason, inhumanism, as it will be argued later, prompts a new phase in the systematic project of emancipation, not as a successor to other forms of emancipation but a critically urgent and indispensable addition to the growing chain of obligations. Moreover, inhumanism disrupts a future anticipation built on descriptions and prescriptions provided by a conservative humanism. Conservative humanism places the consequentiality of human in an overdetermined meaning or an overparticularized set of descriptions which is fixed and must at all times be preserved by any prescription developed by and for humans. Inhumanism, on the other hand, finds the consequentiality of commitment to humanity in its practical elaboration and in the navigation of its ramifications. For the true consequentiality of a commitment is a matter of its power to generate other commitments, to update itself in accordance with its ramifications, to open up spaces of possibility, and to navigate the revisionary and constructive imports such possibilities may contain. The consequentiality of commitment to humanity, accordingly lies not in how parameters of this commitment are initially described or set. Rather, it lies in how the pragmatic meaning of this commitment, its meaning through use, and the functionalist sense of its descriptions, what must we do in order to count as human, intertwine to effectuate broad consequences that are irreconcilable with what was initially the case. It is consequentiality in the latter sense that overshadows consequentially in the former sense, before it fully proves the former's descriptive poverty and prescriptive inconsequentiality through a thoroughgoing revision. As Robert Brandom notes, every consequence is a change in normative status that may lead to incompatibilities between commitments. Therefore, in order to maintain the undertaking, we are obliged to do something specific to resolve the incompatibilities. From the perspective of inhumanism, the more discontinuous the consequences of committing to humanity, the greater are the demands of doing something to rectify our undertakings, ethical, legal, economic, political, technological, and so forth. Inhumanism highlights the urgency of action according to a tide of revision that increasingly registers itself as a discontinuity, a growing rift with no possibility of restoration. Any socio-political endeavor or consequential project of change must first address this rift, or discontinuity effect, and then devise a necessary course of action in accordance with it. But doing something about the discontinuity effect, triggered by unanticipated consequences and, as a result, the exponentially growing change in normative status, that is, the demands of what ought to be done is not tantamount to an act of restoration. On the contrary, the task is to construct points of liaison, cognitive and practical channels, so as to enable communication between what we think of ourselves and what is becoming of us.
The ability to recognize the latter is not a given right or an inherent natural aptitude, it is, in fact, a labor, a program, that is fundamentally lacking in current political projects. Being a human does not by any means entail the ability to connect with the consequences of what it means to be human. In the same vein, identifying ourselves as human is neither a sufficient condition for understanding what is becoming of us, nor a sufficient condition for recognizing what we are becoming, or more accurately, what is being born out of us. A political endeavor aligned with anti-humanism cannot forestall its descent into a grotesque form of activism. But any socio-political project that pledges its allegiance to conservative humanism, whether through a quasi-instrumentalist and preservationist account of reason, such as Habermasian rationality, or a theologically charged meaning of human, enforces the tyranny of here and now under the aegis of a foundational past or a root. Anti-humanism and conservative humanism represent two pathologies of history frequently appearing under the rubrics of conservation and progression, one an account of the present that must preserve the traits of the past, and the other an account of the present that must approach the future while remaining anchored in the past. But the catastrophe of revision erases them from the future by modifying the link between the past and the present. 3. The Revisionary Catastrophe the definition of humanity according to reason is a minimalist definition whose consequences are not immediately given, but whose ramifications are staggering. If there was ever a real crisis, it would be our inability to cope with the consequences of committing to the real content of humanity. The trajectory of reason is that of a general catastrophe whose pointwise instances and stepwise courses have no observable effect or comprehensive discontinuity. Reason is therefore simultaneously a medium of stability that reinforces procedurality and a general catastrophe, a medium of radical change that administers the discontinuous identity of reason to an anticipated image of human. Elaborating humanity according to the discursive space of reason establishes a discontinuity between human's anticipation of itself, what it expects itself to become, and the image of human modified according to its active content or significance. It is exactly this discontinuity that characterizes inhumanism as the general catastrophe ordained by activating the content of humanity, whose functional kernel is not just autonomous but also compulsive and transformative. The discernment of humanity requires the activation of the autonomous space of reason. But since this space, way the content of humanity, is functionally autonomous even though its genesis is historical, its activation implies the deactivation of historical anticipations of what humanity can be or become at a descriptive level. Since anti-humanism mostly draws its critical power from this descriptive level either situated in nature, allegedly immune to revision, or in a restricted scope of history, based on a particular anticipation, the realization of the autonomy of reason would restore the non-theological significance of human as an initial necessary condition thus nullifying the anti-humanist critique. What is important to understand here is that one cannot defend or even speak of inhumanism without first committing to the humanist project through the front door of the Enlightenment. Rationalism as the compulsive navigation of the space of reason turns commitment to humanity into a revisionary catastrophe, by converting its initial commitment into a ramified cascade of collateral commitments which must be navigated in order for it to be counted as commitment. But it is precisely this conversion, instigated and guided by reason, that transforms a commitment into a revisionary catastrophe that travels backward in time from the future, from its revisionary ramifications, in order to interfere with the past and rewrite the present. In this sense, Reason establishes a link in history hitherto unimaginable from the perspective of a present that preserves an origin or is anchored in the past. To act in tandem with the revisionary vector of the future is not to redeem but to update and revise, to reconstitute and modify. As an activist impulse, redemption operates as a voluntaristic mode of action informed by a preservationist or conserved account of the present. Revision, on the other hand, is an obligation or a rational compulsion to conform to the revisionary waves of the future stirred by the functional autonomy of reason. 4. Autonomy of Reason. But what exactly is the functional autonomy of reason?
it is the expression of the self-actualizing propensity of reason, a scenario wherein reason liberates its own spaces despite what naturally appears to be necessary or happens to be the case. Here necessary refers to an alleged natural necessity and should be distinguished from a normative necessity. Whereas the given status of natural causes is defined by is, something that is purportedly the case because it has been contingently posited, such as the atmospheric condition of the planet, the normative of the rational is defined by ought to. The former communicates a supposedly necessary impulsion while the latter is not given, but instead generated by explicitly acknowledging a law or a norm implicit in a collective practice, thereby turning it into a binding status, a conceptual compulsion, a naught. It is the acknowledging, error tolerant, revisionary dimension of ought, as opposed to the impulsive diktat of a natural law, that present sought as a vector of construction capable of turning contingently posited natural necessities into the manipulable variables required for construction. In addition, the order of ought is capable of composing a functional organization, a chain or dynasty of oughts, that procedurally effectuates a cumulative escape from the allegedly necessary is crystallized in the order of here and now. The functional autonomy of reason consists in connecting simple oughts to complex oughts or normative necessities or abilities by way of inferential links or processes. A commitment to humanity, and, consequently, the autonomy of reason, requires not only specifying what oughts or commitment abilities we are entitled to, but also developing new functional links and inferences that connect existing oughts to new oughts or obligations. Whether Marxist agenda, humanist greed, or future-oriented perspective, any political philosophy that boasts of commitments without working out inferential problems and without constructing inferential and functional links suffers from an internal contradiction and an absence of connectivity between commitments. Without inferential links, there is no real updating of commitments. Without a global program of updating, it becomes increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to prevent humanism from stagnating as an organ of conservatism, and Marxism from sliding into a burlesque of critique, a grab bag of cautionary tales and revolutionary bravado. No matter how socio-politically adept or determined a political project appears, without a global updating system, such an enterprise is blocked by its own internal contradictions from prescribing any obligation or duty. Indeed, in its commendable attempt to outline what ought to be done in terms of functional organizations, complex hierarchies, and positive feedback loops of autonomy. The recent hash accelerate manifesto signifies a Marxian project that is in the process of updating its commitments, publications, 2013. Also available online at comma it should come as no surprise that such an endeavor receives the most derision and scorn from those strains of Marxism which have long since given up on updating their cognitive and practical commitments. 5. Functional Autonomy the claim about the functional autonomy of reason is not a claim about the genetic spontaneity of reason, since reason is historical and revisable, social and rooted in practice. It is really a claim about the autonomy of discursive practices and the autonomy of inferential links between oughts, that is to say, links between constructive abilities and revisionary obligations. Reason has its roots in social construction, in communal assessment, and in the manipulability of conditionals embedded in modes of inference. It is social partly because it is deeply connected to the origin and function of language as a deprivatizing, communal, and stabilizing space of organization. But we should be careful to extract a robust conception of the social, because a generic appeal to social construction risks not only relativism and equivocation but also, as Paul Boghossian points out, a fear of knowledge. The first movement in the direction of extracting this robust conception of the social is making a necessary distinction between the implicitly normative aspect of the social, the area of the consumption and production of norms through practices, and the dimension of the social inhabited by conventions, between norms as intervening attitudes and normalizing norms as conformist dispositions. Reason begins with an intervening attitude toward norms implicit in social practices. It is neither separated from nature nor isolated from social construction. However, reason has irreducible needs of its own, 
Kant, and a constitutive self-determination, Hegel, and it can be assessed only by itself, Sellers. In fact, the first task or question of rationalism is to come up with a conception of nature and the social that allows for the autonomy of reason. This question revolves around a causal regime of nature that allows for the autonomous performance of reason in acknowledging laws, whether natural or social. Therefore, it is important to note that rationality is not conduct in accordance with a law, but rather the acknowledging of a law. Rationality is the conception of law as a portal to the realm of revisable and navigable rules. We only become rational agents once we acknowledge or develop a certain intervening attitude toward norms that renders them binding. We do not embrace the normative status of things outright. We do not have access to the explicit, that is, logically codified, status of norms. It is through such intervening attitudes toward the revision and construction of norms through social practices that we make the status of norms explicit. Contra Hegel, rationality is not codified by explicit norms from the bottom up. To confuse implicit norms accessible through intervening practices with explicit norms is common and risks logicism or intellectualism, that is, an account of normativity in which explicit norms constitute an initial condition with rules all the way down, a claim already debunked by Wittgenstein's regress argument. 6. Functional bootstrapping and practical decomposability. The autonomy of reason is a claim about the autonomy of its normative, inferential, and revisionary function in the face of the chain of causes that condition it. Ultimately, this is a neo functionalist claim in the sense of a pragmatic or rationalist functionalism. Pragmatic functionalism must be distinguished from both traditional AI functionalism, which revolves around the symbolic nature of thought, and behavioral variants of functionalism, which rely on behaviors as sets of regularities. While the latter two risk various myths of pan-computationalism, the unconditional omnipresence of computation, the idea that every physical system can implement every computation, or behavioralism, it is important to note that a complete rejection of functionalism in its pragmatic or Kantian rationalist sense will inevitably usher in vitalism and ineffabilism, the mystical dogma according to which there is something essentially special and non-constructible about thought. Pragmatic functionalism is concerned with the pragmatic nature of human discursive practices, that is, the ability to reason, to go back and forth between saying and doing stepwise. Here, stepwise defines the constitution of saying and doing, claims and performances, as a condition of near decomposability. For this reason, pragmatic functionalism focuses on the decomposability of discursive practices into non-discursive practices. What ought one to do in order to count as reasoning or even thinking? Unlike symbolic or classic AI, pragmatic functionalism does not decompose implicit practices into explicit, that is, logically codifiable, norms. Instead, it decomposes explicit norms into implicit practices, knowing that into knowing how, which is the domain of abilities endowed with bootstrapping capacities, what must be done in order to count as performing something specific. According to pragmatic or rationalist functionalism, the autonomy of reason implies the automation of reason, since the autonomy of practices, which is the marker of sapience, suggests the automation of discursive practices by virtue of their algorithmic decomposability into non-discursive practices. The automation of discursive practices, or the feedback loop between saying and doing, is the veritable expression of reason's functional autonomy and the telos of the disenchantment project. If thought is able to carry out the disenchanting of nature, it is only the automation of discursive practices that is able to disenchant thought. Here, Automation does not imply an identical iteration of processes aimed at effective optimization or strict forms of entailment, monotonicity. It is a register of the functional analysis or practical decomposability of a set of special performances that permits the autonomous bootstrapping of one set of abilities out of another set. Accordingly, automation here amounts to practical enablement or the ability to maintain and enhance the functional autonomy or freedom.
The pragmatic procedures involved in this mode of automation perpetually diversify the spaces of action and understanding insofar as the non-monotonic character of practices opens up new trajectories of practical organization and, correspondingly, expands the realm of practical freedom. Once the game of reason as a domain of rule-based practices is set in motion, reason is able to bootstrap complex abilities out of its primitive abilities. This is nothing but the self-actualization of reason. Reason liberates its own spaces and its own demands, and in the process fundamentally revises not only what we understand as thinking, but also what we recognize as us. Wherever there is functional autonomy, there is a possibility of self-actualization or self-realization as an epochal development in history. Wherever self-realization is underway, a closed positive feedback loop between freedom and intelligence, self-transformation and self-consciousness, has been established. The functional autonomy of reason is then a precursor to the self-realization of an intelligence that assembles itself, piece by piece, from the constellation of a discursively elaborative as qua an open source self. Rationalist functionalism, therefore, delineates a non-symbolic, that is, philosophical, project of general intelligence in which intelligence is fully apprehended as a vector of self-realization through the maintaining and enhancing of functional autonomy. Automation of discursive practices, the pragmatic unbinding of artificial general intelligence and the triggering of new modes of collectivizing practices via linking to autonomous discursive practices, exemplifies the revisionary and constructive edge of reason as sharpened against the canonical self-portrait of human. To be free one must be a slave to reason. But to be a slave to reason, the very condition of freedom, exposes one to both the revisionary power and the constructive compulsion of reason. This susceptibility is terminally amplified once the commitment to the autonomy of reason and autonomous engagement with discursive practices are sufficiently elaborated. That is to say, when the autonomy of reason is understood as the automation of reason and discursive practices, the philosophical rather than classically symbolic thesis regarding artificial general intelligence. 7. Augmented Rationality The automation of reason suggests a new phase in the enablement of reason's revisionary agent constructive vector. This new phase in the enablement of reason signals the exacerbation of the difference between rational compulsion and natural impulsion between ought to as an intervening obligation and is as conformity to what is supposedly or naturally the case, contingency of nature, necessity of foundation, dispositions, conventions, and allegedly necessary limits. The dynamic sharpening of the difference between is and ought heralds the advent of what should be called an augmented rationality. It is augmented not in the sense of being more rational, just like augmented reality that is not more real than reality but in the sense of further radicalizing the distinction between what has been done or has taken place, or is supposedly the case, and what ought to be done. It is only the sharpening of this distinction that is able to augment the demands of reason and, correspondingly, propel rational agency towards new frontiers of action and understanding. Augmented rationality is the radical exacerbation of the difference between ought and is. It thereby, from a certain perspective, annuls the myth of restoration and erases any hope for reconciliation between being and thinking. Augmented rationality inhabits what Howard Barker calls the area of maximum risk not risk to humanity per se, but to commitments which have not yet been updated, because they conform to a portrait of human that has not been revised. Understood as the labor of the inhuman, augmented rationality produces a generalized catastrophe for unupdated commitments to human through the amplification of the revisionary and constructive dimensions of ought. If reason has a functional evolution of its own, cognitive contumacy against adaptation to the space of reason, the evolution of ought rather than the natural evolution of is, ends in cataclysm. Adaptation to the evolution of reason, which is the actualization of reason according to its own functional needs, is a matter of updating commitments to the autonomy of reason by way of updating commitments to human. The updating of commitments is impossible without translating the revisionary and constructive dimensions of reason into systematic projects for the revision and construction of human through communal assessment and methodological collectivism.
even though rationalism represents the systematicity of revision and construction, it cannot by itself institute such systematicity. To rephrase, rationalism is not a substitute for a political project, even though it remains the necessary platform that simultaneously informs and orients any consequential political project. 8. A Cultivating Project of Construction and Revision The automation of reason and discursive practices unlocks new vistas for exercising revision and construction, which is to say, engaging in a systematic project of practical freedom. This is freedom as both the systematicity of knowledge, and as knowledge of the system as a prerequisite for acting on the system. In order to act on the system, it is necessary to know the system. But insofar as the system is nothing but a global integration of tendencies and functions, and insofar as it has neither an intrinsic architecture, nor an ultimate foundation, nor an extrinsic limit, it is imperative to treat the system as a constructible hypothesis in order to know it. In other words, the system should be understood by way of abductive synthesis and deductive analysis, methodic construction as well as inferential manipulation of its variables distributed at different levels. Knowledge of the system is not a general epistemology, but rather, as William Wimsatt emphasizes, an engineering epistemology. Engineering epistemology a form of understanding that involves the designated manipulation of causal fabric and the organization of functional hierarchies, is an upgradable armamentarium of heuristics that is particularly attentive to the distinct roles and requirements of different levels and hierarchies. It employs lower level entities and mechanisms to guide and enhance construction on upper levels. It also utilizes upper-level variables and robust processes to correct lower-level structural and functional hierarchies, but also to renormalize their space of possibilities so as to actualize their constructive potentials, yielding the observables and manipulation conditionals necessary for further construction. Any political project aimed at genuine change must understand and adapt to the logic of nested hierarchies that is the distinctive feature of complex systems. This is because change cannot be effected except through both structural modifications and functional transformations across different structural layers and functional levels. Numerous intricacies arise from the distribution of nested structural and functional hierarchies. Sometimes, in order to make change at one level, a structural or functional change at a different, seemingly unrelated level must be made. Moreover, what is important is to change functions whether at economic, social, or political levels. But not every structural change necessarily leads to a functional change, while every functional change, by virtue of functions playing the role of purpose attainment and dynamic stabilization for the system, results in a structural change, although such an alteration in structure might not take place in the specific structure whose function has just changed. The significance of nested hierarchies for the implementation of any form of change on any stratum of our life makes the knowledge of different explanatory levels and cross-level manipulation a necessity of utmost importance. Such knowledge is yet to be fully incorporated within political projects. Without the knowledge of structural and functional hierarchies, ambition for change, whether through modification, reorganization or disruption, is misguided by the conflation between different strata of structure and function on the levels of economy, society, and politics. Therefore, only explanatory differentiation of levels and cross-level manipulations, complex heuristics, are able to transform dreams of change into reality. In a hierarchical scenario, lower-level dimensions open upper levels to possibility spaces, which simultaneously expand the possibility of construction and bring about the possibility of revision. At the same time, descriptive plasticity and stabilized mechanisms of upper-level dimensions adjust and mobilize lower-level constructions and manipulations. Combined together, the abilities of lower levels and upper levels form the revisionary constructive loop of engineering. The engineering loop is a perspectival schema and a map of synthesis. As a map, it distributes both across different levels and as a multitude of covering maps with different descriptive prescriptive valences over individual levels. The patchwork structure ensures a form of descriptive plasticity and prescriptive versatility, 
It reduces incoherencies and explanatory conflations and renders the search for problems and opportunities of construction effective by tailoring descriptive and prescriptive covering maps to specificities. As a perspectival compass, it passes through manifest and scientific images, stereoscopic coherence, assumes a view from above and a view from below, telescopic deepening, and integrates various mesoscales which have their own specific and non-extendable explanatory, descriptive, structural, and functional orders, non-trivial synthesis. The revisionary constructive loop always institutes engineering as re-engineering, a process of re-modification, re-evaluation, reorientation and reconstitution. It is the cumulative effect of engineering, WIMSAT that corresponds to the functional and structural accumulation of complex systems, as that corrosive substance that eats away myths of foundation and catalyzes a cumulative escape from contingently posited settings. The error-tolerant and manipulable dimensions of treating the system as a hypothesis and engineering epistemology are precisely the expressions of revision and construction as the two pivotal functions of freedom. Any commitment that prevents revision and does not maintain, or more importantly, expand, the scope of construction ought to be updated. If it cannot be updated, then it ought to be discarded. Freedom only grows out of functional accumulation and refinement, which are characteristics of hierarchical, nested, and therefore decentralized and complex systems. A functional organization consists of functional hierarchies and correct inferential links between them that permit non-trivial orientation, maintenance, calibration, and enhancement, thereby bringing about opportunities for procedurally turning supposed necessities and fundaments associated with natural causes into manipulable variables of construction. In a sense, a functional organization can be interpreted as a complex hierarchical system of functional links and functional properties related to both normative and causal functioning. It is able to convert the given order of is into the intervening and enabling order of ought, where contingently posited natural limits are substituted by necessary but revisable normative constraints. It is crucial to note that construction proceeds under normative constraints, not natural constraints and natural determinations, hence, realism, that cannot be taken as foundational limits. Functional hierarchies take on the role of ladders or bootstraps through which one casual fabric is appropriated to another, one normative status is pushed to another level. This is why it is the figure of the engineer, as the agent of revision and construction, who is public enemy number one of the foundation as that which limits the scope of change and impedes the prospects of accumulative escape. It is not the advocate of transgression or the militant communitarian who is bent on subtracting himself from the system or flattening the system to a state of horizontality. More importantly, this is also why freedom is not an overnight delivery, whether in the name of spontaneity or the will of people, or in the name of exporting democracy. Liberation is a project, not an idea or a commodity. Its effect is not the eruption of novelty, but rather the continuity of a designated form of labor. Rather than liberation, the condition of freedom is a piecewise structural and functional accumulation and refinement that takes shape as a project of self cultivation. Structural and functional accumulation and refinement constitute the proper environment for updating commitments both through the correcting influence of levels over one another and the constructive propensity inherent in functional hierarchies as engines of enablement. Liberation is neither the initial spark of freedom nor sufficient as its content. To regard liberation as the source of freedom is an eventless credulity that has been discredited over and over, insofar as it does not warrant the maintaining and enhancing of freedom. But to identify liberation as the sufficient content of freedom produces a far graver outcome, irrationalism, and as a result, the precipitation of various forms of tyranny and fascism. The sufficient content of freedom can only be found in reason. One must recognize the difference between a rational norm and a natural law, between the emancipation intrinsic in the explicit acknowledgement of the binding status of complying with reason, and the slavery associated with the deprivation of such a capacity to acknowledge, which is the condition of natural impulsion. In a strict sense, freedom is not liberation from slavery, 
it is the continuous unlearning of slavery. The compulsion to update commitments as well as construct cognitive and practical technologies for exercising such feats of commitment updating are two necessary dimensions of this unlearning procedure. Seen from a constructive and revisionary perspective, freedom is intelligence. A commitment to humanity or freedom that does not practically elaborate the meaning of this dictum has already abandoned its commitment and taken humanity hostage only to trudge through history for a day or two. Liberal freedom, be it a social enterprise or an intuitive idea of being free from normative constraints, that is freedom without purpose and designed action, is a freedom that does not translate into intelligence, and for this reason, it is retroactively obsolete. To reconstitute a supposed constitution, to draw a functional link between identifying what is normatively good and making it true, to maintain and enhance the good and to endow the pursuit of the better with its own autonomy, such is the course of freedom. But this is also the definition of intelligence as the self-realization of practical freedom and functional autonomy that liberates itself in spite of its constitution. Adaptation to an autonomous conception of reason, that is, the updating of commitments according to the progressive self-actualization of reason, is a struggle that coincides with the revisionary and constructive project of freedom. The first expression of such freedom is the establishment of an orientation, a hegemonic pointer, that highlights the synthetic and constructible passage that human ought to tread. But to tread this path, we must cross the cognitive Rubicon. Indeed, the intervening attitude demanded by adaptation to a functionally autonomous reason suggests that the cognitive Rubicon has already been crossed. In order to navigate this synthetic path, there is no point in staring back at what once was, but has now been dissipated, like all illusory images, by the revisionary winds of reason.